Hello and welcome to another All A Chat episode. This is episode number five. In this one, we'll talk about guitar production with two amazing guests. Leo Abrahams, all the way from London, a guy who's been working with great names uh, from Paul Onetini on, and he'll explain more in details. And also Enrico Kiko Seselega from Italy, uh, who's been working with the guitar gods, Steve Vai, Paul Gilbert. Uh, and I'm very excited to dive into guitar productions. Uh, well, we'll see where this takes us. So guys, uh, hello and welcome uh, to the show. Hello, thanks for asking us to join. Yeah, thank you. You're very welcome. Um, would you mind do you like a short one, two sentence introductions of yourself so I don't mess things up? Uh, Leo, maybe you can start? Um, well, uh, I'm a guitar player and a producer from London and uh, I always thought that at a certain point I'd sort of transition from guitar to production all the time, but I'm I'm glad to say that I still have that mixture of things in my um, in my career, and uh, I enjoy them both equally. Um, and yeah, it's been my pleasure to work with some great artists over the years, and still learning and excited to hopefully pick up some tips myself uh, about guitar recording. Beautiful, Enrico. What's your story? All right. Actually, it's very similar to the one Leo because I'm very, I'm very, very in love with, with guitar still. I mean, I've been playing all my life, uh, but I mostly went into the recording and mixing engineering. That's why I get my most of my living income from. I do a lot of seminars, Japan, India, South America and stuff for like mixing and producing. But I'm a guitar player and I try to play as much as possible and get involved in projects. So it's good that we are two people that are at the same, uh, you know, same kind of love for the instrument, you know, so it's good. Yeah, but that's what I guess that makes this uh, this episode a little bit uh, special in a way. Um, so I'll, I'll dive into the first question that, you know, it, it's something that's close to me, to my home as well. Um, the sound of a guitar, right? It's it's a big debate every time. How does your guitar sound? What do you use? What strings? What amps? Etc. A lot of about the gear, then a lot about the, the chords being used and how you play, etc. So, how much of the sound does come from a player, and how much does it come from the the gear? Enrico, maybe you can start on that one. Okay, uh, sure. I mean, I mean, uh, I think I think everybody agrees that uh, the sounds. I mean, you can, you know, there is a big saying that you can have a, sh a very piece of crap guitar and give it to somebody random and it sounds like a crap. You give it to guitar god, it sounds great. So of course the player makes the difference. I mean, that's uh, that's a logical choice. But you know, um, it's uh, it's a combination of everything because you can also be a great player. Uh, but not having enough um, the gear, the the chance to ex express yourself because you have a poor recording. Just uh, just the basic poor recording with the poor level just already kills the the vibe. So without even talking about gear and stuff, you know. Exactly. Sorry. So but that's what I want to ask Leo now, right? So sure, the player does a lot of things, and but there's also what the player plays. Right. There is a song that was made, there's a, maybe a solo part that was designed, put together, produced in a way. Um, so how much of that overall quality of a song, of a sound, etc., comes down to producing the right notes in the right way, Leo? Well, it's going to get philosophical really quickly, but <laughs> all, of, all of this happens within the context, of course, of music. And there's a cliche about guitar players that they just want to sort of shred over everything. But it hasn't really been my experience, not just me personally, but fortunately, most of the people I work with is that they're interested in music and the guitar is their vehicle um, to make that music. And going back to the whether, you know, a guitar is crappy or a very good quality or whatever, it's kind of about the relationship that you have with that instrument as a musician in whatever context you're in. So for sure, um, you can have a, a challenging instrument even, but make something great with it. Or you can hand a 57 Les Paul to someone who doesn't have the sensitivity and it's not, it's not going to sound very good. But for sure, one of the nice things about producing um, 
younger bands is that they're excited. I'm sure you have the same experience. They're excited to see your gear, you know, and there's definitely a difference between, you know, the guys um, copy guitar and the real thing, for example. And there is an audible difference, but it also, I think, in, the guy might be more inspired when he's playing the vintage instrument. Who knows? But yeah, it's mm. all related. You, you did mention relationship with music. Right? So maybe we can touch on that. Um, what does that mean, relationship with, with music? What is that entire? What, what do you mean when you say it depends on your relationship with music? Leo, maybe. Me. Um, well, there's a sort of conversation going on between what you're hearing and what's in your head or in your heart and then your hands. Mm. Um, that's, that's it, really. And I think one of the jobs of the producer is to try and make the environment as comfortable as possible for the musicians so that um, mm. they can hear what they're doing, they don't feel self-conscious and everything, the whole technical process is as, as transparent and frictionless as possible. Because um, in general, I, I, yeah, I think people I, I, perform better when they're more relaxed. Uh, absolutely. But, but I do maybe see this going two ways. So one side would be this kind of like emotional relationship, what you feel, what's in your heart. But there's also this technical relationship. Um, when I say that, I, I mean more like what is your attitude towards um, instruments? What is your attitude toward uh, other instruments playing, other musicians, etc.? So it's not just a relationship with music that lives inside of you, but it's also a relationship with, well, people and the technology that is available to you as a, um, as a tool, a creative tool. Enrico, what do you think about that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I I agree with you and I agree with Leo at the same time. It's uh, you know, you you have to be uh, on my point of view. You you need to know what's going on on the other instruments because you are there to help other people to express the better. So, for example, I am a guitar player and I love guitar, but I also love drums. So I can definitely. Uh, rely very well with drummers but you know it's been a time in my life that I've been very involved with the horn sections stuff like that for my work so I really wanted to I interview some friends of mine who play trumpet or plays uh, trombone and ask them about the physics and the way they play the way to express what they can do what is the emotional uh, also because there's all the breathing involved of course over there so and um, if it, 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 I think it, it, all of that is in the process because you definitely need to make them comfortable. That's for sure. You're a stranger for the, your, your client, most of all. So this is the first step. Then you need to know what's going on on their world. And, and of course, you need to cope with the, all the technical issues behind that. I mean, that's something they, they, they don't have to know, but you have to know. If, I don't know if I answer right, but there is a long, it's, it's very long from the music to the emotional situation, but also to the technical and the physical aspect of the instrument and the, the technique involved, for sure. That's my, that's always it's something that I always have to cope with. I, I agree completely. The, there is though an interesting thing that you mentioned kind of mentioned uh, the trust between the artist and the technician, right? You said you need to know physical things, uh, math at some point, right? You can calculate things. You need to know signal processing, a lot of things. Uh, so how do you build trust um, over the years? Uh, and then on the flip side, how do you build trust when you have a stranger? Like you said, most of, most of the times, you are the stranger uh, to your to your clients. They may maybe meet you for the first time. So how do you make this bridge of making them trust you that whatever uh, cab you decide to use or whatever mic you decide to use is the right one, the right choice without second guessing you, Enrico? You know, uh, I started from the point that uh, it's a common saying that uh, music is a people's world. So again, you it's a combination between you being polite open, kind, but also very prepared. I mean, people love to see, um, they love to notice that you are prepared, uh, that you know what you're talking about. So I'm not the one that always put myself in the front. I'm not the kind of guy, but when you, I'm in studio and I 
have my guest uh, uh, doing the recording, you know, the studio, whatever I am, whenever I am. But I always, whatever and whenever I am, I always put them in a condition to understand that I really can help them because I know what they're talking about. I know what we're going to do. I actually make sure they know what I'm going to do and the process. Because people, uh, some musicians at some point, they kind of get lost between recording and mixing and all this process and how it's going to go in steps and everything. And sometimes already just uh, make them clear about the process, what it's going to be, what it's going to be like, what we're going to do, and, and everything, that's, it, it builds a trust, uh, for sure, for sure. Um, yeah, I would say, I would say, sorry, I would say so, actually. Mm. So, Leah, there was a magic word in Enrico's answer, um, which was preparation, right? So there's a lot... You, you need to prepare for anything. Usually they say the success of a project comes to 80% preparation, 20% execution, right? Um, as a stereotype. But I, I mean, I guess it, it's kind of true. It definitely rings true uh, inside all of us. Um, so I'm wondering for you, Leo, when you approach, you mentioned earlier before we, we went live that you, you have your own productions, your own songs. Um, how do you prepare for those kind of production versus working with somebody else, is there a different preparation process? That's that's an enormous question, <laughs> but um, I think the hard thing about working alone is that part of self-production is not being too hard on yourself when it's not going well. Mm. But in a way, your prep, your whole life is a preparation for whatever moment. I mean, the thing that I've really learned from from the greatest people I've worked with whether they're guitar players or not is to have a hundred percent commitment to the sound that you're making at all times I don't think there should be any kind of joking around you know even when you're if you if you want to play something jokey then play it jokey with your entire heart you know um, I think that when other people come into my space or when I go into a, a space with a with another artist there's usually goodwill there on both sides. It's a bit like giving a best man speech at a wedding. Like people want you to succeed. I think you have mm. to work quite hard to lose trust. Um, and there's just kind of mutual sensitivity there within the room. And it's very different whether you're dealing with a multiple instrument setup, obviously, or a single instrument setup. For some reason, I thought, I assumed the focus of this was going to be concentrating a little bit more on guitar focused recordings but the band thing is kind of a different kettle of fish entirely um so i'm quite happy to experiment when i'm on my own but i'm also happy to experiment with other people because i don't see the point of preparing unless you're then going to discover something further mm. so mm. i mean p people watching this may or may not know that i spent a long time in a way a sort of a traineeship in some ways with Brian Eno and the thing that that really impressed me about him and still does is that he creates a safe environment for people to experiment and I think that's the best thing you can give a musician to say there you know there's no chance of fucking up here anything you do is valid and I've got the technical side you know don't worry about that you can explore and when I'm working on my own that's what I try and do for myself is to let myself off the hook Okay, so maybe we can touch a little bit on the, well, obviously you guys are working with the highest order of professionals all over the world. Um, obviously our clients and, and guys listening to this will mostly be home producers or artists working from home, especially in the past few years. I think, well, the majority was kind of pushed into uh, learning new tricks and stuff and all about the gear, etc. So do, do you think there is a like a, a um, entry trick or something that you can, a basic setup that you can use uh, with quite good results? So for example, me as a drummer, I do know that if I'm using SM57 on a snare, I'm kind of in the safe zone no matter what. Um, is there a, a similar situation with a, with a guitar, something that anybody can use and get a decent result? Uh, maybe Enrico and then Leo? Uh, well, um, okay, I'm coming from uh, uh, this uh, rock area, no? I mean, um, 
18 years, 18 years ago, I used to work for Favorite Nation labels, which is a Steve Vai's personal label, besides Steve Vai. And it was about being having Frank Gambale, having uh, Chad Walkerman, having all these people. And, uh, and the, 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 the stuff was done absolutely in studio in an analog way. So, of course, I mean, if you compare this to, I mean, this is the, the basic standard. And they always say for the, for the guitar, and that's what I use when I can, uh, I always use two microphones. You mentioned the SM57, which is like the Swiss knife for the, of the microphones in, in general. And the 57 on the guitar were in amplifier, of course. Amplify guitar works great together with the 421. It's a common thing that I use. I use in Steve Lukaten for the uh, for the Yardbirds track. Uh, I Steve I uses just Satriani uses the double mics or triple mics with the Royer M180. But uh, and of course this is not an entry stuff because as you know, when once you have microphones, you need to have some mic pre's, and then so we need to go up in price and everything. And I'm not I'm not really a nerd on that. I have never been. I mean, I have a camper on my own, a camper amplifier in my place. And when I go to Japan, uh, I do work with a band called Baby Metal. Sometimes some of the Baby Metal musician is a huge band over there, and all the musicians they use. Only camper, even in studio. So you see, it's like everybody said, the oh, camper is good for live, but it's not good for studio. Uh, uh, but also we're talking about the microphone. So you see something in the way in, in between. To finish up, uh, so I can make it shorter, uh, a starting setup would be to, I always say to people, look, you need to slowly, whenever you have the budget for, that's my best suggestion. Whenever you have budget for, just think ahead and think what you're gonna read, what you, what you need to reach. You wanna reach your amplifier and get the amplifier recorded. So start with the mic, then you're gonna get possibly a good um, mic pre. Of course, before everything, a good sound interface for the for the conversion. And slowly you get there. I always say people just go in steps because if you have a big budget, you can do everything you want. And that's that's self-explanatory. That's my point of view. I'm very technical. I'm I'm very I'm very immediate on this because there's no really right or wrong. It's like where you wanna go. You wanna have your amplifier and nine o'clock and nine sorry and nine turn up and record it like Eddie Van Halen. So get your mics, get your mic pre's and slow it. Otherwise, camper fractal and all that can give you very decent uh, effects. You know. Sorry. Here we go. <laughs> So, Leah, do you have a similar opinion, or is there a setup that you are always kind of taking with you? No. Well, what do you put in a backpack if you would need to go somewhere? What would you take with you? Well, bef before we go there, I have to say I'm I'm totally fanning out here because I really love so many of those records. And I was when I was a teenager, I was a huge Steve Vai fan. I think I, I went to go and see him when I was 15, ran to the front and managed to grab his his velvet boot. And that was a very thrilling moment for me. And uh, I used to learn his material and it was just great. So it's really nice to meet you here, I have to say that. Um, it's very similar to you. I use a two mic setup as my basic thing. It's a 57 and an M160 usually. You yeah, get... We've lost you for a second. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Can you hear me now? Am I back? Yeah, getting there. It's used uh, to it. yeah. it was, uh... Oh, okay. Yeah, we, we, we've lost you with the velvet boots. The velvet boots. Well, that, yeah, was, exactly. that was the important bit. So I'm glad that that, that got, I'm glad that got through. Um, so anyway, about the gear, I'm very, very similar to you. I, I usually have a two mic setup as my starting point, a 57 and in my case, an M160. And they, you can get kind of the body from one, brightness from the other one. And that's not beyond, I mean, that's a reasonable budget actually i think for a start for a starting point those two microphones notwithstanding mic pre's like you said i mean it's debatable even whether it's easy for a lot of people to record a cabinet at the correct volume in whatever setup they have i mean here in london even rooms that you hire and pay for you have to kind of keep the noise down because often there's people next door renting their room and they don't want to hear a guitar cabinet at, at high volume so what I was going to move on to say somewhat controversially, in addition to the Kemper and, and that, that kind of gear, some of the amp simulators in, in the UA stuff is good. There's STL tones, who I think are associated with Kemper. That can be good. And of course, then what you end up with um, is a DI, which maybe later on, you know, you might go to a big studio and reamp the, the DI. It's, it's kind of flexible. And I have nothing against that. that 
what I've personally found is that um, whereas they can sound very impressive on their own, the, the plug-in versions of amps, once you start to multi-track them, they kind of start to crush up a little bit. Um, and that's where you hear their, their shortcomings. But for me personally, the best ones are STL tones. You can actually layer those up and it's convincing. Or mix and match, the, the Brainworks stuff is also very good. But I wouldn't rule that out. And then of course it depends what genre you're working in primarily, but when I'm working on my stuff, which is quite electronic or experimental, I use a lot of DI guitar with no amp simulator because I want to capture some of that low, even sort of sub that can come off the string and some of that very top end, which a, a guitar cabinet just smashes off, but which you can filter off and use for other stuff. So really there are no, obviously there are no rules. It, it depends what you're working on, but I certainly think there's no shame in using uh, software amps, Kemper, whatever. You can have a great result with those things and 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 work with that. Mm, absolutely. Oh, we do have a few more, uh, a few minutes left. Um, maybe we can touch on on acoustic guitars. Um, <laughs> I, I do I do have like a little bit of experience. Again, I'm a total amateur, but it's a completely different approach. Uh, and uh, maybe you guys uh, can share something with the community when you are recording. The acoustic guitar what would be like the two or three main things that you need to sort out before we even attempt that maybe enrico you can start and also i would like to hear from you leo as well okay uh, look i i usually go on, on my standard setup i mean standard setup because i try it i try it i learn it on my own and then i and then i use it all the time and which is actually i mean usually this the safe microphone will be a condenser microphone like a fancy one a small diaphragm on the in front of the 12th on uh, the 12th fret that's a standard thing that gives you the string is the the sizzle and everything i love the player perspective which is the microphone or condenser just you put like with the behind you and it goes like this and face the guitar which is right here no and you face the guitar and i love that one because putting in the front can be difficult with the hands moving and the guitar is kind of reacts reacts very very differently depending where you are also i i if i have a chance to have a third mic if i have a good room or at least i can get one or two meters in front of me so because acoustic instruments tend to rebuild all the um, the wave the waves a little bit in front and that's something that always we use uh, the very last thing if the guitar has a di jack I usually track this one as a safe net in case I need something that I got lost somewhere and they can be used for some sort of, some mixes. Maybe they I use also a little bit of the DI signal, to be honest. Here we go. Very short. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, and Leo, how do you approach uh, acoustics? Well, very similar. Um, I don't know if I could put it better. The, the only thing that I would add is that um, a simple but reliable method is the cross pair in front of the um, cross pair of small diaphragm condensers in front of the 12th fret or wherever you find the sweet spot to be. Um, also, sometimes mid-side. Um, a friend of mine, an engineer at Air Studios, has this interesting setup where he has the mid-side to the lower um, side of the sound hole and then another another omni in front of the 12th fret. And it's that that is the most beautiful guitar sound I've ever played with it's so natural and yet not kind of intimidating like sometimes even as a I've been doing this for a long time but some acoustic guitar sounds it makes you afraid to like shift in your seat even and this is an excellent technique but it's quite hard to replicate you need a good sounding room as you said um, so yeah once again we are in agreement in agreement. <laughs> beautiful so th th there is a, a little thing that I just uh, kind of sparkled in, in my mind which is when uh well two things one is if you're using multiple mics um um then you have these phase issues and stuff like that so i'm wondering how how to approach that um and secondly um um usually you would have some sort of a click track or something that you know the player would need require so how do you mix that make sure that the player feels right um you know that 
hear the guitar in a natural way, but at the same time still ha have a decent playback without leaking out, especially with maybe even nylon strings, which is even quieter probably. Um, so how do you approach this, this kind of thing, uh, Leo? Well, um, carefully. <laughs> I mean, you started off by you started off by talking about the phase thing. I think if you're in doubt about that, you shouldn't be doing it if there's another person there. It's fine to have a go on your own, and I, I take longer over my own acoustic guitar sounds because I'm I can be patient with myself. Um, I mean, about about the click bleed, I can't say I run into that problem too much. I think it's good to encourage musicians to have sensible monitoring levels and the right kind of click the right kind of headphones closed back headphones and i mean if you have your headphones too loud all that really happens you might know this as a drummer all that really happens after a certain spl level is you just get the anxiety response you know so it shouldn't be that loud and i've had it recording string quartets that because there's four people in maybe crappy headphones and you can hear the click track i just um use the uh, isotope software to get rid of it. I mean, obviously, nobody tracks anything planning to use isotope, but it can get you out of a fix. But more generally, it's about good quality headphones, the right click and, and encouraging the player to have a sensible balance. But what, what do you think, Enrico? Um, I actually absolutely agree with you. And um... But but the, on the other end, as sometimes happens, especially if you have, for example, a recording for a pop project, you really need the, the guitar player. Of course, you can always add it. We didn't say that, but okay. Uh, they always have to have the um, the player kind of really really tight on the timing. So sometimes you need to give them a little extra click track because they need it and they want it. Of course, like you said, it's the tone. You can select or now you can select the tone. I usually use something very bassy and not really peachy because that's stuff that always goes out especially with a microphone with a player perspective that's a that's a hell that's a hell so what i do for example i tell you what i do what i do when i have this i put usually if they can play with this i usually put the actually the click on the other side so on the left side uh, in my case and also sometimes i ask them to bring them their earphone so they're gonna put the earphone behind uh, underneath the big phones and i only send the click to the earphones so it can really go in they need less volume and also you have the big ones where they can hear the guitar which protects as an extra muffle for the for the click for the click to bring to breathe you know what i mean so it's just so they have two sets of uh, headphones one earphones really inner uh, with the with the click and the extra ones and on the left side and for the phase, the last time, the last time, like uh, Leo was saying, of course you need to be sure what you're doing. You can always check, but I mean checking is not always as a great experience. I mean it's not that easy. And also when you phase invert, you know better than me than you phase invert 180. So it's not that you fix the problem unless there's something not really there. So you really need to be careful. With, to be honest, with this technique, uh, you are pretty sure there is no phase problem, most likely. Hmm. Well. The player will maybe move a little bit as well, but uh, th there is a, uh, an interesting uh, experience, my own experience, again, I'm an amateur in this, uh, but, uh, you know, like little buttons and stuff uh, that you have maybe on your shirt or if you have like a bracelet or stuff oh, like yeah. that, uh, I, I think this these things can, you know, uh, turn out uh, to be a problem later on. Maybe you don't even notice Absolutely. them at the start. So, uh, in, is, is this something that you guys are very, you know, peculiar about? Do you notice it upfront? Uh, what's your experience? Uh, uh, if I start, uh, no watches, <laughs> no watches, no bracelets. Uh, I always put tape on the chair and I make sure that the chair is no squeaky and stuff because chairs can be very tricky. <laughs> chairs can be very tricky, especially if you do recording for a solo artist. If you do just guitar tracking, that as you, you're just going to hear the strumming inside the big pop stuff, it's not really the, I mean, bracelet, yes, but the squeaky chair, yes, all of that, absolutely. What about you, Leo? Yeah, the squeaky chair, that's the worst of all. It's, it's also bad on piano. But yeah, it's like before you record acoustic guitar, it's like at the airport, you have to put everything in the tray and then get it down there. But um, 
yeah i think the, actually the thing that i come up against when i'm recording myself on acoustic is jeans or like the guitar hearing the guitar move against your trousers that is a killer so i actually have a special cloth that doesn't make much sound that i bring to certain sessions oh, wow. especially when it's very quiet some sometimes people want you to play ultra quiet and they want to hear all the all the finger noise and intimacy mm. and then yeah you can get in trouble also my note i have a slightly wonky nose so i have to remember to breathe through my mouth because <laughs> breathing you know that's another one yeah uh, it's a very i know oh <laughs> that's bad yeah but, uh acoustic guitars are kind of a little bit more tricky to to get it right they are tricky um, yeah, yeah they are that's... tricky because they're to get it clean they are tricky they are tricky. And on top of that, there is the performance. So everything, I mean, the, the player has to be very careful with the noises and he has to be aware of that. And they have to play able well, which is not really, it's not really uh, switching life from day to night, you know? Uh, and then so, play it emotionally, play it passionately, but don't, <laughs> make, yep. don't make too much sounds. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All these degrees, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, Leo, Enrico, thank you very much for joining in, in this uh, episode. Uh, it, it was a blast for me. Uh, I think we thank could you. talk like for hours about this. Uh, we do have a limit here. So this one is, uh, as always, sponsored with Headliner Magazine UK, uh, distributed over YouTube, Spotify, etc. So you guys can catch it there and just to let uh, know our our um, listeners know so we do have a youtube channel uh, so you can watch us talk about this as well as listen to us uh, and you're welcome to join and check the previous episodes where we were talking about um, Dolby Atmos for example and headphones in general we we do make headphones by the way we didn't talk much about headphones we are a headphone manufacturer uh, having of Leon course. and Rico talk about guitars uh, uh, which is wonderful so anyway, uh, to wrap this uh, up, thank you again, Leo and Enrico, and I hope that we can uh, pick it up again sometime. Thank you Pleasure. very much. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>